This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome everyone to this edition of Pensacola State Perspectives. Our program today is all about teaching excellence, specifically our award-winning faculty who were recently inducted into the Pensacola State College Academy of Teaching Excellence. I'm Patrice Witten, Executive Director of Development and Alumni Affairs, and here with me today are two very special guests, Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Martin Gonzalez, and Professor of Social Sciences, Lisa Sims. Let's begin. Dr. Gonzalez, tell us about the Teaching Academy, the Teaching Excellence Awards, and the history. My pleasure. The Academy of Teaching Excellence was established by Dr. Charles Atwell in 1986. Dr. Atwell was at that point in time our Vice President for Academic Affairs and, and our Executive Vice President. And he saw a tremendous need to recognize the fine faculty and the work that they were doing at what was then Pensacola Junior College. Mm -hmm. And so there, the purpose and the goals of the Academy. Well, the purpose of the Academy is to recognize those faculty members who are excellent faculty members in the classroom, that they have sustained excellence in their teaching. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Pensacola State College and then, of course, Pensacola Junior College has always been recognized for is its excellent teaching of small classes. This is, of course, an area that we feel like we excel at. And, of course, in order to recognize the faculty, we needed some special event and opportunity to do so and the Academy of Teaching Excellence is such a venue. What is the impact on faculty or professors? Well, it gives the faculty an opportunity to be recognized for what they do and what they do well. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are not that many opportunities when you think of outside of the classroom. So one of the things the Academy of Teaching Excellence does is enable students, administrators, staff, at the college to recognize the faculty for the fine work that they do. And of course, becoming a member of, of the Academy of Teaching Excellence, of course, gives us a special way to recognize them for this fine work. Mm -hmm. Very important. How are the winners chosen? Well, the winners are chosen uh, district-wide. What we do is we have a form that is distributed, and this form is distributed to the student emails, it's distributed on the college's Facebook. It's distributed to every department in hard copy form. And of course, the faculty, the staff, all of the students, our student groups are, uh, are allowed to nominate faculty for the Academy of Teaching Excellence. And of course, once they are nominated, the faculty are notified, and at that point, they will be given an application to submit. And once they fill out this application with all of the support materials, then of course there is a way in which they are selected from that process. It sounds like it's a very important aspect of what we do here at the college. Now you've been here for quite a few years, <laughs> and uh, you want to comment on the evolution of this mm -hmm. academy and the recognition of our faculty? Right. I'm finishing my 23rd year here at the college and I have been in instructional affairs or academic affairs in one way or the other the whole time I've been here. So one of the things that I feel very, 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 very important is for the college is to recognize the great instruction that takes place at the college. And it gives me great pleasure to be a part of the Academy of Teaching Excellence and to be able to uh, emcee, if you will, the Academy's induction program that they have each spring. And we're going to see some clips here in a minute of the program that recently occurred. Um, Lisa Sims, a professor, social sciences, and also you have another title, and that is chair of the academy. What do you see happening, and that's, you're the incoming chair, as I understand. That is correct. What do you see happening for the coming year? 
Will this be perpetuated? Well, I, it will. It will. Yeah. We're, in fact, we're going to celebrate our 25th anniversary beginning now. Mm -hmm. I hope everybody will stay tuned as we um, move into that um, celebration time period where we recognize Dr. Atwell's great vision for helping us teachers mm -hmm. to feel good about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, the faculty have their own space, uh, the winners of the, uh, the, the uh, I guess you would say members of the Academy. It's a very special honor and there's recognition, very specific, and they actually have their own place here at the college. Would either of you like to comment on that and why that was set aside? And I believe it's named the Charles Atwell Room? It is. It's in the new library, a beautiful room, place, a place for us to meet, a place for us to archive information dating back the entire 25 years. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how wonderful it is to have this academy. Um, if you would allow me to talk about that Certainly. from a faculty Absolutely. perspective, yes. just a little bit. But I want to begin by giving you a pop quiz. I'm a teacher. Mm -hmm. Are you ready for this? Okay, here's the question. Why do people decide to become teachers? Is it A, because they want to become famous? Is it B, because they care about being rich? Or is it C, because they care about people? Hmm, boy, that's a tough one. What do you <laughs> think, Dr. Gonzalez? <laughs> well, I think I have been in this business for over 40 years, so I know that getting rich is not why we go into <laughs> education. So I, I feel yeah. fairly confident about that. I also feel fairly confident becoming famous is not something we're going to probably be likely to accomplish in education. But I do know that the teachers that I know and most of the teachers that I know here at the college and I would say all the teachers probably in the, who have been inducted into the Academy of Teaching Excellence, they do it because they have a passion for what they do. They have a passion for teaching, just like a musician has a passion for playing music and a writer has a passion for writing. And, and more than likely, anyone that's a professional has a pr passion for what they do. And teachers certainly have a passion for teaching. Yes, they do. And we certainly admire and respect our, our faculty and our teachers um, everywhere, K through 12 and higher ed. Um, tell me some of the goals of the academy. Well, the goals of the academy really support the faculty members. The main most goal is to celebrate and to recognize excellence. And this is so important since we, by the way, A plus Dr. Gonzalez, that was the correct <laughs> answer. We don't go into this for money, fame, or fortune. We go into because we care. And there's not a there's not a way you can monetarily reward something like that, but by simply getting accolades and recognition from our peers and from our students, I can't tell you how I felt. I was so honored when I found out that, that my students and my colleagues and the learning community of which I'm a part here said that I was doing a good job. And we wonder sometimes, we give of ourselves and we hope and we pray, but a lot of times all we hear is the bad stuff from the students. So this was this is a wonderful thing. And I wanted briefly to tell you how awesome Pensacola State is at making us feel special. It starts out with a dinner, which um, Dr. Um, Gonzalez mentioned earlier. We have a, a five-star dinner and uh, the culinary students provide for us. We get our picture made with the president. We get our um, picture all in the, um, the green and white, the mm -hmm. major publication of the college. And this is my cohort the year we came in. Um, then we get an all expense paid trip to Austin, Texas to a wonderful conference and I'll talk about this conference in just a minute but the great thing about this conference is that we do again get recognition and we get a lovely medallion mm -hmm. from the conference which we can bring back and wear at commencement ceremony. So if you go to a graduation ceremony here at Pensacola State College you may see approximately 180 people wearing these medallions proudly showing that we're a member of the Academy. And we really appreciate this honor and recognition from the State College. Well, and I think from the audience's perspective, I want to know that we're going to have the very best teachers for our community, leaders, future leaders, and um, you know our children coming up now from the high schools and, and those levels. I wonder, Dr. Gonzalez, um, could you comment a little on this year's winners? I know we're going to meet them in a moment, but. Right. I, I think you're going to be very pleased to see this year's winners because they represent all aspects of the institution. There are some winners here that teach primarily in our career and vocational programs. 
there are some winners here, or if we can, inductees, if you will, who represent primarily our transfer programs. But you're going to see that they span the whole spectrum of the faculty that we have here at Pensacola State. And as Ms. Sims said, uh, another way that we recognize the faculty is a hall of honor, or wall of honor, if you will, in our library where f the photographs of all of the winners or all of the inductees into the Academy of Teaching Excellence are located so that students walking through the second floor of our library can see the special faculty on this special wall that is part of the Academy of Teaching Excellence. Okay, thank you so much, both of you, very, very much for being here today. And now let's meet the 2010-2011 winners of the Academy of Teaching Excellence. I love plants, that was the main reason why I went into landscaping and horticulture, but I really love working with students, and I love working with students that their goal is to own their own businesses and start their own businesses and improve the businesses that they run. I have 18 year olds all the way up to 65 year olds. It's funny, a lot of times I have students that are 40 and they, they're hesitant to come to school because they feel like they're going to be too old and I say a lot of times you're going to be the youngest person in a class it, and it just depends. One of the things I tell my students is the only thing that I can't teach them is how to love being outside and love plants. You really have to have a love for plants and landscaping and if you've got that then learning all the technical skills and everything should most of the time comes very naturally. The fields of landscaping and horticulture are wide open and golf course management. Um, greenhouse production. Even people that have been in the industry for a long time realize that there is a benefit in getting an education and that's one of the things I think a lot of people just don't understand especially when they hire a landscaper is that it really does pay off to hire somebody that's got an education because they really do more, know more than someone that's just managed to learn on their own. The job that I have is so unique it's rare that you would find a position where you would be able to teach landscape design and then teach a greenhouse crop management class and then yet the same day maybe teach a botany class where it's very much more you know technical um, rather than vocational and it really is an environment where you really do have to have good working relationships with people and um, everybody at the college is so supportive some of my best friends are people that work here that I've met through the college um, so I wouldn't want to work anywhere else. I love my job because I get to do so many different things. I teach upwards of 24 different classes. I get to go to golf courses. We get to go to botanical gardens, uh, greenhouses. Um, we have the flower festival every year. That's a, a big part of the Milton campus. Um, so I wouldn't trade it. Work Excited pages, so what you have to remember, is there are three different kinds of Work Excited pages. My undergraduate de graduate degree is in secondary education, so I started out teaching high school in South Carolina, and I taught a high school there for a couple years. And then I got married and kind of put education off. And then when circumstances changed, I went back to school, got a master's degree in English, and started teaching college again. And I've been teaching for 20 years now. I tend to be a traditional teacher. I teach very traditional methods, traditional style. The study of literature t teaches us how to, to read with understanding. And that discretionary reading and that discretionary understanding comes from reading literature. The more literature you read, the more you, you hone those skills. There is a correlation between what we teach in, in writing in Comp 1 and Comp 2 and what they use with technology. And the biggest thing is today's generation are students who have never lived in a world without a cell phone. They've never lived in a world without a computer. They don't understand anything but what they know. And they are very visual learners. So it's real hard for them to make the connection to a printed page because that connection isn't there. So my job as the instructor is to, to take the printed page and s make the connection for them. And by doing that, the world comes open. We want that moment where you know they've got it and now they can use it. They've got what you wanted. They've grasped the information. 
to see their growth and their development and to know that you played a small part in that, that is what makes teaching worthwhile. That is the magic and that's what I enjoy the most. We have a, a faculty that come from a lot of different directions but everybody has their own strengths so it makes it very nice because you can depend on them, you can go to them and ask for help and they in turn will come to you and that makes working here very, very enjoyable. Are you finding calculus in the posterior region yes. too? Yes, some calculus and um, I have more calculus built up in the anterior mandible region section there. I think I've always been a teacher in one way, shape or form. But in the private sector, I worked in a private practice for many years, working for a single dental practice. And then I moved on to the military base where I worked as the dental hygiene supervisor and I trained dental technicians in the military there. And then I decided that after 22 years it was time for me to share my experiences with others. I encourage a lot of group activity, certainly because they, they learn so much better that way. And we have such a mixed group of students that they share their own experiences with each other and you have someone who has never stepped into a dental office to someone who's worked as an orthodontic assistant for many years that work in a group together and can come to the same conclusions on things and who can apply what they're learning. So group activities usually is what we, we end up doing in class. The concepts are there, it's the application that's always harder and that's when it takes some guidance on a teacher's part to help the student try to take what they've learned. It's easy to memorize something. It's a lot harder to try and apply it. And that's what dental hygiene is. It's a lot of critical thinking. Turn a little bit more this way for me, please, Mr. Planis. Thank you. You have to establish some kind of relationship with them, a relationship of trust, so that they know that they can rely on you to guide them properly, to supervise them, and that you're out to look out for them, too. You almost become the patient's counselor at the same time. You build this relationship with them and they trust you almost with their life. And sometimes they come in and it's not about cleaning their teeth or it's not about taking care of their mouth. It's taking care of who that person is. It takes a special person to be a dental hygienist. And that persona translates and you, you can see it right when they first come in that they're committed to what they want to do, they're dedicated to studying and getting there, and they're willing to do whatever it takes to do it. You know, I love my profession, so why not share it? During our discussion today, when I talk about BPH, that's, that's referring to benign prostatic hypertrophy. Well, I graduated from nursing school back in 1981, so I've been a nurse for 30 years. And I decided that I wanted to begin to work with uh, nursing students and uh, to share my experience and my knowledge with them for the next generation of uh, professional nurses. I think uh, those of us who are drawn to the nursing profession are drawn for reasons. And it's not, you know, many times it's because we want to do something that is uh, more meaningful with our life's work, um, you know, to better, uh, you know, society. Well, in the classroom when I work with the students, uh, a lot of times I'll, there will be a lecture component to the, the unit that we're working on, but then um, I'll be doing a group project with them or perhaps case studies. We do some concept mapping, and so that gets the students into um, working with each other in terms of trying to apply the information and the knowledge uh, that they've gained from studying the unit. And um, when we're in the clinical setting, in the labs, that side of uh, my teaching is more uh, demonstration for them and modeling behaviors and then uh, making corrections and, and uh, mentoring them as they're practicing their skills. And then we get into the hospital setting many times, um, then I have to kind of sit on my hands because it's at that point I have to let them kind of get in there and have their hands on patients and, and things and I'll just whisper in their ear or I'll nudge them a little bit in terms of what I might need for them to do, but many times they're very ready at that point and it's just a matter of maybe talking a little bit before we go into a patient's room for a procedure um, and just kind of reminding them about some of the things we had talked about and then they go in and, and they're, they perform just fine. 
It's always the same, your physical assessments, your vital signs, your body mechanics, your infection control, all these um, fundamental concepts that I teach in my course are used throughout um, every course that they have in the nursing program and every area of nursing that they could possibly go into, they'll be using these fundamental skills. The faculty here at Pensacola State College in the nursing department, I want to say we probably have about 20 on faculty right now. We work well together and all of that's had a very, very positive effect on the results that our students have had. So it's been very rewarding to work with the colleagues. I've really enjoyed that part of the academic field as well. And who's going to be our question reader? I started just teaching as an adjunct, enjoyed it, went back to school for my MSN, taught in St. Louis for years and then moved to Pensacola was adjunct in Pensacola from in the summers of 93, 94, 95, I believe, and then we moved full-time in 97. So I've been here since 1997 for 14 years. When I taught at first, everybody was about the same age. They were right out of high school. And now, you've got age range. Like, my last class was 17 to 60. They're working, they have kids, they have, you know, and they just really want to know, if you know what you're doing, um, can you get me through boards? My spiel is always, I want you to be work ready and I want you to be able to pass boards. I don't want you to leave here not knowing what you're doing. If you take that message to them, I think they take it to heart and they do work hard. It's a year program and they have to know everything. It's probably the hardest level when you have a one year program and they have to kind of fend for themselves and make sure, be an advocate for the patient, you know, make sure everything goes smoothly. We do get out in the clinical when we take the students and that's really where all the learning takes place. And you know, if they ask a question about equipment, you go, you go get it and you show them right there. It's, it's hands on, you do it real time. They understand it much better. What is the normal ICP range? My students compete in something called HOSA and we were practicing for the quiz bowl. The students actually were studying neuro and they had written their own questions and so we were using the student developed questions to one to help study for the test the next day and two practice for our, our quiz bowl team versus um, just class members that would volunteer and it's kind of neat because they get excited about competing against one another. They actually get real proud when they know an answer nobody else knows on the team and they save the team. <laughs> My fellow staff, oh, wonderful. We've worked together in the LPM program for a long time. That's great. Now under the new ACLS, we give it for Y complex tachycardia as a diagnostic criteria. I'm a 18 year public safety veteran. Started in the fire service back in 1992. Uh, progressed up through the ranks of the fire service. Uh, put myself through emergency medical technician and paramedic school. Emergency medicine is a very new profession. A lot of people don't realize how new we are. We've only been around since 1970. And so a lot of what we did was just practice based. If it sounded good, we did it. And over the last five to 10 years, we've moved from that practice based to evidence based medicine. And that's really changed our profession a lot because everything we do now is evidence based. So there's a scientific reason behind what we do. The trick is with using your practice based skills bringing in the classroom is to go from not from war story to war story but to take a certain story a certain experience that you had and plug that into a lesson plan working in the field you can actually see the difference that you're making with somebody you can actually use your skills and you can see it real time in the classroom you have to be self-motivated to know that the people that you're teaching are going out and making that difference i really enjoy pensacola state college we just have a a wonderful cadre of experienced instructors at the program. And we have established a set of core values, honor, valor, and responsibility, and we, we teach those responsibilities to our students. And we have seen uh, the employers have noticed a difference. They're hiring our students at a faster rate. They're coming through the new programs. They're being much more successful in the field. Uh, and they're just, um, the camaraderie of the students is there. We have really great facilities here. Um, we have a great simulation program here that we're able to, to get our students in. And I've never been in a college where we can immerse our students in simulation education like we've been able to do here. 
and simulation allows students to take what they've learned in the classroom, take what they've learned in the lab, and actually bring those together. And it's where we can really promote critical thinking. A lot of our students, this is literally a dream come true when they get to come through their program. It's a, they're realizing a dream in their life. And so they're very motivated, they're very dedicated to our programs. We'll bread this zucchini and eggplant, fry it, and then we'll put it together as a casserole with a little bit of a marinara sauce, and that'll be one of our vegetables today. Pretty much started about 40 years ago with a company called Morrison's Cafeterias. One of the things uh, that the students would, would testify to if you were to talk to them is that the demands of the program are, are high. Uh, we have high expectations, but I do believe that the students uh, appreciate that. We have uh, about 100 students in the program. Uh, of course, they have to start out in the basics. They uh, begin with what we call techniques, which is a beginning cooking class and also a beginning baking class. Once they're through that side of it, then they progress to our production classes. Uh, out of the 25 years that I've been teaching, thinking now, and as I tell the students, there's very, very few that don't make it through techniques. And that really kind of sets them up to move on to the production classes and, and have that confidence that they need, you know, particularly in uh, the production classes to do things that are more elevated. The students not only prepare the food, but they also spend a semester uh, being in the front of the house and working as dining room staff. We have a 100% grad rate right now, uh, placement rate, and uh, they, uh, they have no problem. In fact, truthfully, they all work. You know, at this point, there's very few that aren't working in the industry that are in the program. Every student that comes in wants to, wants to own their own business, and, and I interview with every student, and we talk about that, and, and certainly I encourage that. It does take a special person. Uh, you certainly can't be afraid of work. Uh, the monetary side is going to be a wow. It's, it's going to take time. If I were into it for specifically the money, I probably would have gotten out a long time ago. But I didn't. You know, I, I stuck with it. And one of the things that I'll tell students is, how many people can you talk to and ask them, would you do the job that you're doing now again? And I say, I would. Well, this is actually my ninth year at uh, Pensacola State, and uh, it's been a, a really gratifying experience, I have to say. We hope you enjoyed getting an up-close and personal view of our award-winning professors. We're very proud of them, and we look forward to seeing you next month for another edition of Pensacola State Perspectives. I'm Jeff Weeks, and I love to talk, but I find I learn a lot more when I listen. I hope you'll listen in on the next conversations. We talk with engaging personalities from all walks of life. Sports, business, politics, science, entertainment, literature, you name it. Some are names you know, others are ones you'll be glad to get to know. No talking points or agenda-driven tirades. It's real conversation that matters. Conversations with Jeff Weeks, Thursday at 7.30 and Friday at 9.